Welcome back. It's time for uh, the last video lecture in our series of uh, video lectures for the extended argumentative analysis module uh, for critical reasoning. So this is the part three video and actually I'm not going to waste any time uh, so I don't forget about this. Um, the code for this video block, the code word that you'll put into the, the quiz um, for watching these videos, uh, let's do let's do pennant. Pennant is the code word this time Next to my Cubs playing the Dodgers again tonight uh, in the National League Championship Series. Hopefully we go to the World Series. We'll see. But pennant. Pennant is the code word for this time. Okay, so um, got that done. Now I don't have to worry about forgetting about it. Uh, that's great. So what's the game plan for this video? This video is going to be uh, a little bit more of a, of a homework review preparation slash talking about the paper project that you're working on and uh, the upcoming exam which will be here uh, very soon so I'm actually uh, I'm recording this on I think this is the 16th yeah I've gotten a little um, behind on my video recording schedule but um, I'm planning on trying to have the uh, exam up by Wednesday the 19th so if you're watching this uh, but we're gonna review some homework here so we're gonna look at um, this coffee essay again and I'm, I'm spending so much time on um, the coffee essay because it's a perfect example of exactly what I'm asking you to do for this um, this uh, paper project which is also perfect preparation for what I'll be asking you to do on the exam so you're uh, let, so let's talk about that first but I do want to also uh, let you know another thing I planned for this video is to talk a little bit more about suppressed premises and working that out. So I'm actually I want to look through a couple problems here from exercise uh, six um, and kind of along the way at, while we work on on this too. Which remember again involves uh, three steps: annotating, putting arguments into standard form, and then diagramming those arguments. So uh, let's let's talk about those first since these are um, this is a very important uh, skill to have down uh, for the paper project which which is coming up and will be due soon and then the exam so this little essay here that we're using as an example is uh, far uh, well this is definitely longer than what you'll see on the exam you're gonna get a couple of arguments that are probably about half this size somewhere like one of them's kinda like this and the other one's kinda like that um, in terms of amount of prose that you'll be analyzing and you're you're going to do I'm gonna ask you to do these three steps with it to annotate it to put the argument into standard form and then to diagram it and I wanted to kinda of demonstrate a little bit more of this so you get a clear picture of what it'll look like to do this when you're doing it on the exam on canvas and also what you'll upload uh, for the for the paper project too so uh, the paper project obviously is gonna be a lot longer because I'm asking for 500 words for this essay so you're going to have a lot more to analyze, but it's going to, it's going to be great practice uh, to get that, to having to analyze something that's a lot larger than what you'll have on the exam. Uh, and it's just good for learning for learning this stuff. Most of the time, um, any kind of sustained argument that isn't just like a sound bite is going to take a little while uh, to get out there. So anything that's probably worth, um, that's large enough that's worth analyzing and really digging into uh, will look something more like that. So let's let's get to it um, the first I, this is gonna feel a little awkward because normally I just you know tell my students to draw on the page and do the annotations that way but we're doing this online so you'll get a uh, when you when it comes to you'll either type this you know if it's a paper project you're gonna have already typed up your essay on the exam I will give you this kind of block of text that'll be the example that you'll be analyzing and you'll be um, putting in your annotations so you'll do them kind of like this I want you to do a highlighting um, and then followed by a parentheses so if we had something like um, like I don't know I'm just pulling these and this you notice I've taken all the numbers out of it because this is what it's gonna look like on the exam and of course what it'll look like on the paper so here is something remember we had uh, guarding here so you could put something like guarding like this highlight the section you're annotating and then what you're annotation annotating it as if you also want to just stick to like a G I can tell that that's guarding so for example if you had your annotations looking something like 
argument marker reason or alternatively you could just do reason marker or argument marker conclusion or conclusion marker that's gonna be fine assuring guarding discounting I'll know what those are e positive and then e negative if you just did your annotations like this that'd be great so if I'm looking down through here where this was something uh, poor that will make you know e negative you know the and that's a bad thing sort of thing so we got that um, so this was a conclusion marker I'm just I'm not doing this exhaustively of course but you can get the idea of what the annotations are gonna look like this is what you'll have to do so the big the big thing here is that you're not your attention is not being pointed into certain directions so you have to be listening having have that radar up to do all that sort of thing and then I will have you uh, do once you know you'll have the text here that you'll be able to do your annotations on but then when it comes to the standard form and diagram uh, how are you gonna do this well you're gonna have to have a word document um, that you'll have up or some other whatever I don't know whichever uh, word processor you like to use if you got word or something else um, and you'll do this you will you'll type this up while you're work while you're looking at the exam while it's open on canvas you'll type this up in a separate document and then I'll have you upload it to canvas and that will be how you'll give me your answers um, if it when it comes to the diagram you can draw it like I'm using Microsoft paint <laughs> uh, you can draw it with Microsoft paint the way that I've been doing it even if it looks kinda sloppy like this that'll be okay with me I will understand but um, if you also wanted to uh, say um, draw it on a piece of paper just handwritten with like pen and pencil something like that and then take a picture and then upload your picture uh, that also will be possible on on the way that you'll take the exam I I still need to uh, I'm still working out all the mechanics about how to program canvas to do this um, but I, I'm pretty sure I'll be able to make this happen um, worst worst case scenario I'll have the exam and then I'll make a new homework assignment that you can just upload these files to that are like the supplement to the exam um, but something like that you'll you'll have the opportunity to do it that's how I'll want you to do it you'll be using a word processor to do the annotations and to put the argument in standard form and then you can use something like Microsoft Paint or if you want to get nuts like Photoshop or Illustrator <laughs> it doesn't have to look nice or whatever sort of thing that you can do to make an arrow diagram thing or just write it down uh, and then take a picture and you can upload the picture to get those answers but those are the three steps so your answer will will actually have all three steps involved with it as it will uh, on the paper project too so they're basically the same thing paper project these exam problems they're all the same thing all three of those steps um, okay so hopefully that gives you a clear picture of what's going to happen um, what it'll look like, uh, how you do these annotations, how you put things into standard form, and put the diagram together. Um, again, as a reminder, with 500 words, you might get a lot of argumentation going. If you're getting to kind of a couple levels here, of um, you're getting to a, a couple levels of uh, sub arguments, you know, maybe maybe a third level, something like that. At, after that point you can call it quits if you've got like 15 20 premises um, you may have a lot more argument going on in your essay but as long as you're catching the main stuff then if you're getting to 15 20 you can call it quits and call that good and I'll give you that'll be full credit work that's fine with me I, I don't want you to have to do what some of my other students have done where they like turn in 50 premises or something that's so much work uh, that's uh, unreasonable and you know you can get really detailed with it and you might that might be why you do it um, that why you're tempted to do it it's like really really break it down but and this is this is a, another kind of like Goldilocks um, case or like a, a judgment call case but remember the whole point of putting things in standard form and diagram is to give a clear and accurate picture that makes it easier for us to do the evaluation stage so if the whole thing is so complicated and unwieldy and hard to look at then that's not going to help us with we're not going to be able to get a good sense of this um, sometimes there is such a thing as too much detail here there's too much breakdown or too um, fine-grained uh, like hair splitting sort of thing that's always a danger and we want to avoid that but we also want to avoid the danger of oh, I'm sorry pardon me I'm so tired 
um, we also want to avoid the danger of missing out on what are like important significant details too so it's a balancing act here um, and you want to catch it just right but I, mean, I think it might be good to try to restrict yourself if you're if you're getting 15 premises 15 20 premises that's a lot of premises to work with and trying to capture the main arguments remember when I was going through doing all this um, First, I'm just trying to get a general sense and then building in details as they become relevant. Um, you'll notice that a lot of the details that were in this essay uh, haven't showed up yet at the, you know, we're still doing this. We're, this is in progress. We've not finished it yet. Um, it's, we, I haven't, you know, I've only gotten, eh, I don't know. If we've gotten most of the main stuff down. See, that's the thing. You can summarize a lot of the main ideas in the force that they really have without getting into a lot of the details. A lot of times the detailed claims are like supporting arguments that are a couple levels deep um, and we still would want to get them in there for instance uh, this one's talking about um, how equal exchange coffee uh, trades directly with small farming cooperatives at mutually agreed upon prices with fixed minimum rates I mean that's a detail it's going to show up somewhere in here um, but it's going to be at a little lo a lower level of support here um, the conclusion is always the most important thing the main arguments backing it up are the next important thing, and then any arguments defending the claims that were made in those original arguments, those are of secondary importance, and so on, going back. So um, as long as you're using my backwards method, starting with the conclusion, working your way back, and you get to a couple levels of defense, and you're at 1520, call it quits for the paper project, that's fine. Um, as far as the exam problems, uh, if you're getting to 1520 premises on the exam problems, something probably went wrong uh, especially for the first one the second one you can you can build in some suppressed premises and you can get a little longer uh, but definitely not to 20 20 is whoa, way too many um, they're gonna be shorter argu and simpler arguments they're not gonna support that much so some tips hopefully that helps okay um, let's go to these next let's let's talk about some suppressed premises a little bit more so uh, when I've been talking about suppressed premises so far, I've been especially emphasizing um, evaluative claims. That evaluative, a lot of times when we make evaluative claims, um, the we leave um, the uh, normative principles out of it, or uh, use thick concepts, or do other things that makes it less obvious that what we have done is made an evaluative argument. Um, you'll notice um, back back here to this, you know we put in this extra premise here as a helper premise to help out oh wait what is the number of it oops oh yeah we put well this helper premise seven we I guess uh, eight we didn't get in here yet but seven we added in as a suppressed premise using the parentheses again I'm not requiring that but it might be helpful to help out uh, six counts as a good reason for one that buying equal exchange coffee can help small farmers is supposed to be a reason why you ought to buy equal exchange coffee but that's only true if you ought to help small farmers so a lot of times suppressed premises are going to look like that they're going to be helping the premises that were explicitly stated you know this was not explicitly stated but this was and they're going to help out to help them count as actual arguments without this this is a terrible argument and easily objected to uh, there's a big gap in the reasoning here but with this included, it's got a much stronger chance. This is one of the main things I want you to be looking out for for suppressed premises. But like this exercise indicates, there's a lot of other kinds of suppressed premises too. Um, I did want to a little disclaimer here. The book talks about a bunch of different types of suppressed premises. There's one type of suppressed premise that I never want you to worry about. And again, the reason is that I don't want to make you paranoid. Um, students that start thinking about this and start worrying about this I've seen throw tons of suppressed premises in where they don't really belong um, but the one category I'm speaking to are linguistic principles so the book mentions that a lot of times we leave certain definitions out uh, we, we take it for granted that people know what we're talking about and and sometimes we're using words in more technical ways philosophers do this all the time they use a word that has a normal connotation but they use it for a very specialized sort of meaning that kind of thing can happen and clarifying that's pretty important for understanding what's the idea but um, if you start looking for suppressed premises to explain the ideas that are in the words that are being used in the essay 
you will have suppressed premises till the cows come home. So don't I don't worry about that. Just that can be you can just disregard that completely. I don't really care to have you worry about that. I definitely want you to be looking out for evaluative premises. Absolutely want to capture those. But the other ones um, are also important too. Um, th and this is this is uh, the way to sniff out the other ones that are important. Gets to a pretty important skill that, or a, a, I guess just a re it's a really simple technique that you can use to double check your answers. And oftentimes when um, students like really mess up a, a standard form or diagram on the exam, um, usually all it takes is me doing this technique with them really quickly for them to see that like something went wrong. So if you want to try to double check your answers, make sure you're doing it right, um, or give yourself a better chance with the exam, um, I highly recommend using this technique. What is the technique? It's very simple. Once you put together your answer, making your judgment calls as best as you can, take a look at your diagram and just ask yourself, are they really doing what I'm depicting them as doing? I mentioned in the last video, I said <laughs> over and over, like, respect the arrow. Respect the arrow, meaning that the arrow indicates that there's an argument here. So if the person is saying, like, this is true because of this, you know, this arrow is indicating that, or that this is true because of this, right, the arrow is indicating that inferential relationship too. Just double check all the arrows that you've got in your diagram and be like, are they really arguing that? Does that even make sense? Um, usually, if there's a suppressed premise needed, um, and you're like, oh, this is their this is their reason for this as a conclusion, it'll look, it, it might sound really dumb when you put it that way, and when you read it out with the claims as they are articulated in standard form. I feel like, man, now that I look at how it's being diagrammed, like, that's a really bad argument. But if you look at the argument just informally before you analyzed it, like in the original homework problem or exercise or something like that, and it was like, well, no, that, that argument makes sense, but what I have, like, doesn't seem to make sense, then maybe there's something going on wrong there. So kind of just double-checking with yourself and asking, you know, you painted this portrait of the argument, and just be like, does it look like, you know, what I analyzed? Like, if you just read it the way, imagine if someone's just talking to you on the street, and they just read out their argumentative essay to you, and you're like, okay, I understand then see if the picture that you've drawn with standard form and diagram looks anything like that like intuitive picture. And that might be a way that you can uh, look for discrepancies or things you want to clean up. At least protecting against things like totally getting the conclusion wrong, uh, or maybe the, the arrows issues, like did it need plus signs or were they two separate arguments? Um, if you're like, is this a reason for this and it looks really wacky, that might tell you something's up. Okay, so that's important for um, detecting. This technique is just generally useful for detecting suppressed premises. So in this exercise, exercise six uh, from chapter five in this part of the homework, the whole point of this exercise is to help give you some practice at sniffing out when there's a gap in the argument. Remember, that's the technique. Um, it when there's a when then when an argument, let's say, like I'm just gonna mess around with this for fun. Uh, this doesn't have anything to do with the coffee example, but if you've got a diagram and you're like, hey, there's a big old gap in this argument, like if two is the reason why one is supposed to be true, that's a huge leap in logic. This is easily objected to. There's a problem. Then maybe there's supposed to be, oh, let me get the right color again. Then maybe there's supposed to be a, a helper premise here, you know, helping out two so that it could uh, fill in the gap here and actually have a good argument again. That's what you want to be doing in looking for suppressed premises. Only go looking for helper premises. When an argument, as it's explicitly stated, has a terrible support relation, then see if there's a simple uh, suppressed premise to throw in that gap to have it actually count as a good argument. What you're effectively doing is using charity to interpret the argument in its strongest possible light. That's what you're up to when you're uh, looking for suppressed premises. So let's go looking at some of these. And uh, there's a few I really like. Um, OK, there, this probably my favorite one. Well, that's a little hard. Let's let's save this one for later. I love six. Six is the coolest. Um, uh, let's do let's do five. OK. And and be f fair warning here. Some of them in this exercise in exercise six here are real groaners um, and probably not something we'd have to worry about. Um, you know what, actually, yeah, yeah, let's do one, let's do five, and then let's do six. 
So one is pretty simple. Uh, first thing to do is figure out what's the conclusion and what's the premise, uh, premise or premises ex that are stated explicitly. So we got a nice conclusion marker here telling us exactly what's up. We know that uh, this is the conclusion. Britney Spears cannot run for president of the United States is the conclusion. And presumably what comes before it is the premise. So we've got Britney Spears is under age 35. Now, huge logical gap here, right? Just because Britney Spears is under age 35 doesn't conceptually require that she can't run for president of the United States. So what's going on here? What would uh, what sort of helper premise would allow the thing that was stated explicitly to count as a good reason for the conclusion? Um, try to, when you're coming up with suppressed premises, try to make them as non-controversial as possible, as simple and uncontroversial. That's very important because, again, we don't want to put words in their mouth that they don't necessarily mean, and when you start saying wackier things, then the chances that you're saying something that they don't intend just shoots up dramatically. So we want to try to avoid that. We're going to read into things, but not too much. Again, Goldilocks, Balancing Act, Judgment Calls, all of your favorite things. Don't you love fuzzy logic? So much fun. So warm and fuzzy. <laughs> okay, so we need something here like just uh, probably the simplest thing that would fill in the gap would be something like anyone under age 35 cannot run for president of the United States. Really, seriously, it's that simple. Just find, like, what is the missing conceptual piece? If there's a big leap in logic, what's the thing that, if it was true, means that there's no leap in logic anymore, right? What What's the bridge over that gap? That's what you're trying to discover with these suppressed premises. So that was a little straightforward. Some of them get a little more complicated, but that's basically all that you're doing. And if you can catch the really obvious ones, that actually makes the, the harder ones a little easier. Because a lot of times uh, we might be overthinking these problems. We might be trying to uh, make them more sophisticated than they actually are. And also, remember, again, when listening for suppressed premises, I am never asking you for suppressed premises that are unspoken things that are backing up or justifying what has been explicitly said. We're only looking for helper premises, okay? A lot of students um, start overthinking things because they're looking for what justifying the things that were explicitly said. But we're just looking to help out the support relation, not justify that the claims that have been made are true. Okay? That's a that's a big difference. And if you got questions about that, please come and talk to me about that so we can work that out. Um, but that's uh, that's going to save you a lot of pain and misery if you follow my advice there. Okay. So one that was a little easier. Let's do something a little more difficult, like this one. Columbus did not discover the New World because the Vikings explored Newfoundland centuries earlier. Again, we got a nice explicit argument marker. It makes it easy. So here's our conclusion. Columbus did not discover the New World. And the reason that's being offered is the Vikings explored Newfoundland centuries earlier. The first thing that's needed in order for this to be able to count as a reason for this, to connect the dots between the premise and the conclusion, is, uh, you know, the conclusion is talking about the New World. The premise is talking about the Vikings and Newfoundland. So we definitely need a suppressed premise that says that the New World and Newfoundland are the same, or at least that Newfoundland is in the New World, or something like that. That's what we need. Um, another thing that is maybe important here would be, um, and, and this is maybe getting into the territory of linguistic principles, okay? Um, it's like maybe a part of the conceptual logic of the situation. This is one thing that I think the New Land thing, definitely that would be more useful, but... Uh, this is one that could maybe be dropped because it's, a, it's like, oh, I don't know, so obvious or um, uh, conceptually inane <laughs> uh, because it's just a matter of what, what the words mean. But this is the kind of thing that, even if it's inane, it's good practice, okay? Because we're trying to listen for any leap in logic to just connect the conceptual dots here. Uh, but the other thing that I think might be missing here that could be a, a suppressed premise is that things cannot be discovered twice. So if the Vikings explore Newfoundland earlier than Columbus, then he doesn't count as discovering it. Discoveries only happen once. That might be important. Maybe someone's using discovery in another sense of the word or something, and so don't miss that. I mean, it's definitely new to Columbus, but it's not new to the human race. And so maybe clarifying that's important to see how this argument is supposed to actually work. All right. So that one was a little more of a technicality. Let's do one, though. This is why I love number six. It's, that it's actually really meaty. It's like thinking through the logic of what's going on here. And the other nice thing about six here, I'm actually going to let's do some extended reconstruction here because this six is a great example 
about how the copy paste method just breaks down so often and you do need to be prepared to reword claims in your own words when you're putting things together in standard form. So let's take a look. Um, so number six, there must not be any survivors since they would have been found by now. Again, oh, so nice to have these explicit argument markers since it's giving a reason. They would have been found by now is a premise for there must not be any survivors. But um, if we are putting this into standard form, okay, let's let's do this. Um, uh, I don't want to delete all this stuff, but I'm going to do that. Um, so if we just did copy paste, we get this. They would have been found by now. Um, there must not be any survivors. Okay, so if we just did copy paste, this is what the argument would look like. Um, I think we can make this a lot simpler and more direct, saying um, there are no survivors. You know, there's a lot of times the way things are worded grammatically in a sentence or with rhetoric, you know, we can get to the point. What's the claim? There are no survivors. That's really the conclusion. There must not be, eh, it's kind of like a therefore sort of thing. Um, there are no survivors. Not any, no. It means none. Okay? And then they would have been found by now is what we got as the premise. Oop, here we go. This doesn't make sense. For one thing, we got a pronoun. Okay? That's weird. Also, would have is maybe not the clearest thing for seeing the structure of how this argument works. What's really the idea? What's the picture that's painted by this? Um, so the they is referring to the s survivors, but not but there are no survivors they're claiming. So who are they referring to? Well, presumable survivors, hypothetical survivors, or something like that, which might be a clue for what this what sentence is really saying. Um, I think this is a better way of putting the sentence. If there were any survivors then oops then we would have found them by now i think the rest of that language is just fine um i don't mind the would have part but this sort of way of putting it in this if then format is way clearer than this sort of phrasing um, and making things as explicit and direct as possible is really, really, really good. And getting rid of pronouns. Definitely get rid of pronouns. Do that. Or hope you have to tell what's really going on in a lot of these claims when they're in standard form because we've already broken them out and separated them. So definitely get rid of the pronouns. And here, in order to do that, put it in this conditional format. You can also sort of tell that there's a hypothetical thing going on here. And whenever that's going on, using if-then language is probably the best way to do it. Now that you've got the claims, this this is why clarifying can be so helpful. Once once you've got it reworded to put the points as directly as possible, it can be a lot easier to see what's going on here, where before it might have been really tricky to get your just intuitive ear to catch the suppressed premise. Now that you've got it um, worked out like this, if there were any survivors, then we would have found them by now. Therefore, there are no survivors. You can see this doesn't follow from this. Um, there's uh, there's a contingent fact that's being taken for granted here that is just super crucial. Um, and it might take you a little while to see it, but remember, with if-then statements, if and that's another reason why it's good to get it in this format, if-then statements make no claim about this or about this. Okay, It's not saying it's all hypothetical. If this, then this. That's it. It isn't saying that this is happening, and it isn't saying that this is happening. Okay? So that's what we need another claim to help us with. And presumably there's, you know, the, so, well, okay, I'll put it this way. The claim that's missing, we have not found, oops, found any survivors yet. Very important fact. Without that in here, the argument doesn't logically follow at all. It just doesn't make any conceptual sense. But with that in there, this argument is solid, okay? It's really, really good in terms of the support relation. Whether the premises are true or not, who knows? I mean, Especially this one's going to be the controversial claim. But um, this is absolutely required if this is going to provide any sort of chance of justifying the conclusion. Okay, so that was why it was needed. And you would expect maybe this is a kind of claim that would be left out of the argument explicitly because, you know, if you're imagining this in a real life situation, like we're a bunch of search and rescue people, we're already looking around, you know. It's like we would have known probably that we haven't found any survivors yet. It's kind of like the unspoken thing. It's like, yeah, we haven't found any survivors yet. 
you know, I don't, there's no survivors because we would have found them by now if there had been any. You know, that what's taken for granted here is sort of the obvious fact that we haven't found any. But even though it's obvious and even though everyone knows it, it's an important part of the logic of the argument to see whether it works because especially when we're valuing the support relation, we're basically um, evaluating the logic of it. The Do the ideas hang together? Not whether the facts are true, but the logic and reasoning that's being used. Um, so that's why it's important to put all those details in there so that we don't m mistake a, a good argument as a bad one because it's got that huge gap. So that's what's going on there. Uh, I hope that those examples help. Um, we can definitely go through more of them um, in the study sessions. Um, and that's the other thing I wanted to mention. So the exam is, is coming up. Um, you're going to be taking it online. Uh, you're going to have 24 hours when you start working on it to work on it, although it's not open only for that window. I'm going to be giving you a window. Uh, let's see. I think the due date is um, uh, 26th or 29th, something like that. Um, so there's a long window here. If I, if I get it up on the 19th, then you'll have at least a week uh, before you'll have to have the exam completed. At any point during that week plus that you start the exam, then once you start it, then you'll have 24 hours to finish it up. Okay, so you'll the clock only starts when you when you start the exam, but you have 24 hours to work on it, so you won't you know be under the gun. Um, you won't have to rush. If there are some problems that you need to ask me questions about, you'll be able to text or call me um, during that window, and I'll be able to get back to you uh, as quickly as I can. Hopefully, there won't be anything like that. Um, but also leading up to taking the exam, like during this block where it's available, um, I would love to meet with you and do some studying, um, whether that's during the study sessions on Monday or Thursday night, or whether it's some kind of impromptu thing, that, and it's some ad hoc thing that we set up, talking on the phone, something. I want to help you out with this. Usually with my on-campus classes, when I teach this on campus, uh, I hang around for like hours in the afternoon and students can drop in and we study together and get ready for the exam. Um, I'm so cool with doing that. I'm. It's not like I, I'm. I'm not going to give you the answers in particular, but I'm not going to be hiding what's going on with this exam. I want you to be as fully prepared as you can going into it. No surprises. If anything's fuzzy, that we can kind of clear it up a little bit and make you and help you feel more confident leading into that. Uh, calibrating your your intuitions and your judgment calls and all that annoying stuff about this being a, a fuzzy activity in, in, in formal logic. So let me know how I can help. Um, I want you to be very well prepared for this uh, before you get started on it. I think the exam is challenging um, and that's why I'm really happy to give you all this time. I want you to think through it carefully. I want it, you to give it your best shot. Um, so let me know how I can help you with that and leading up to that and preparing for that. Um, and let's go over some more homework together and do do whatever you need. So let me know. Um, all right. Until next time. After the exam is done, then we'll have we'll do a whole new module of fun stuff, some formal logic. I'm looking forward to that. That'll be great. Uh, it's always fun to do. Uh, so, good luck with everything and uh, be in touch. Okay.